let me uh, also thank uh, Steve and the uh, National Federation of Croatian Americans for putting together this program. Um, and, uh, uh, and Steve, the work that you've done, I realize now 25 years uh, in, in this role and, and it, it's been terrific. Uh, Ed, uh, it's great to be on the program with you. Uh, I, we had many uh, conversations. Um, I, I, I will note that uh, there were 169 people who were indicted by that tribunal and not one is at large. Uh, some died before they got to trial, but nobody escaped. Uh, the, uh, but I also very much remember perhaps the most memorable meeting was after you had come back from JEPA and your description of what happened and the courage that you showed there. Um, and uh, uh, I would say to Luka Misicic, uh, boy, I, I'm so glad you presented that history because the way in which the history is told uh, doesn't pay attention to the importance of Bihach as a reason for Operation Storm taking place at the time it did. And, you know, because uh, in America, it's all about America. We talk about the NATO war camp, NATO bombing campaign, but that would have had no impact without the boots on the ground. Um, and uh, I was, uh, if you looked carefully at those pictures of the split agreement, uh, uh, you'll see that I was standing in the background. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I learned not to ask for uh, instructions or permission to go do things. And so, uh, so I, I was invited and, uh, by, by President Tujman and just went down. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, but those were some absolutely uh, critical events. And since uh, Ed mentioned uh, Vukovar week, um, I just uh, uh, wanted to say that the very first place that I went as the first US ambassador to Croatia was to Vukovar. And when I came out to Osijek, uh, there was a, we had a press conference and the first question, perhaps with a little edge on it was, why did you go to Vukovar? So I said, well, I'm the ambassador to Croatia and I went to Vukovar, Croatia. Uh, and uh, that was uh, the first statement that the United States ever made, which actually recognized the uh, boundaries of Croatia, because although we had recognized Croatia in uh, April of 1992, uh, we hadn't actually taken a position on the, on the boundaries. Um, before I say any words about um, Dayton, uh, I also wanna just say a, a word of remembrance of, of the people who, who made it possible, my, my fellow diplomats. Of course, Richard Holbrook, uh, who would uh, love to be here uh, uh, today, and we can just imagine what he, I can hear his voice actually, but also um, the three who lost their lives um, uh, uh, trying to bring about Dayton, Bob Frazier, Joe Krusel, Nelson Drew, who died on, on Mount Igman. And uh, it's a striking thing that in this entire effort to bring peace to Bosnia and Herzegovina, not a single American or NATO soldier lost their lives. But we did lose three diplomats. And if you want to include those who died on the Ron Brown plane crash uh, at part of a peace mission, 38 non-military. So when we get to these situations, there, there are people uh, who are in civilian cat positions who often take uh, very significant risks. And uh, I know, Ed, uh, you were one of those who was really on the front line. Looking back 25 years, um, uh, it, you know, I, I think it is appropriate to reflect how much has been accomplished. Uh, I, I know that Minister Granich will remember President Tujman always talking about Croatia being part of the uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, community. But you know, at that time, that seemed like a very remote possibility. And yet here we are 25 years later, uh, Croatia is a member of NATO, Croatia is a member of the European Union. Um, uh, Croatia was the president, served in the presidency of the European Union. Uh, and so it, an enormous progress has been made. And while, as uh, uh, Luka Misicic pointed out, um, uh, 
uh, uh, the uh, Dayton was never uh, intended as a, a final settlement for Bosnia. Uh, we, we, none of us who were there would have said this was a brilliant agreement in terms of how you would run a country. But it was the most that could be accomplished that ended the war. And 25 years later, that war is over. The war criminals have all been held, uh, at least the internationally indicted ones, have all been held accountable. Uh, uh, people have been able to return, uh, in, at least in some measure, to their homes. There's freedom of movement. Uh, so a lot has been achieved. Uh, you can, and, and I think for those of us who lived through the war uh, and uh, uh, who, who witnessed it, um, we, you know, we, 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 we tend to see things as more uh, half full, uh, the glass half full than, than those who, who look at it and came to the situation afterwards. I wanted to, to say a couple of words about Dayton and how we got there. Uh, uh, first, uh, Dayton grew out of a unique moment in international relations. Uh, the United States was the uh, was in very much which the the sole power in the uh, superpower, but in many ways the sole power in the world. That uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, had collapsed. Russia was uh, uh, you know almost not a factor. The European Union was just getting started. In fact, when the war began, it was the European Community, uh, and it proved uh, uh, at that time unable uh, uh, to the for the project. Uh, China uh, uh, was not the power that it is today. Uh, and uh, so the, the parties um, in, in the Balkans, they, they looked to the United States. Uh, and when we were disengaged, uh, they were not angry that, that we were at least not openly angry. They, they simply sought for us to, to, to get involved. So it was a, a, a time when our word uh, was um, really extraordinarily potent. Uh, and this, uh, this also followed the uh, first Gulf War and the extraordinary display of American technological and, and military prowess. Now, obviously that moment has passed. Uh, it's passed because um, China and Russia have uh, emerged as more important powers. The European Union has evolved. And uh, I would say in the first two decades of this century, We've had a number of setbacks, um, and in a nonpartisan manner, I won't say more about the ill-advised war on Iraq and the incompetent uh, uh, occupation that followed as well, or anything about the last four years. Um, the second point I would make about Dayton is that, uh, and I think uh, uh, Luka Misetic has made this point extremely well, it, it was the, the, the negotiating at Dayton, the way it was organized uh, was brilliant. Uh, you know, bringing everybody to a place outside of Washington, kind of locking them up for three weeks. Uh, the whole system was, was, was you know, the, the, exactly the way in which you would run a negotiation by that, like, in that way. And the whole team of people who were involved deserve a lot of credit. But it was the product of, 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 of a trajectory of events that went back at least to 1993. Uh, and the beginning of it, I would say, uh, is, goes to uh, Mate Granic, uh, who became foreign minister that year, the same year I arrived a few months later as the first US ambassador. And our first discussions were about the muslim Croat War, as it was called then, uh, the atrocities that were taking place uh, in uh, uh, Bosnia, particularly the holding of, um, of, of Bosnian uh, Muslims by the HVO in inhumane conditions, uh, and uh, the uh, leadership uh, of Mate Boban. Uh, and what Mate Granic did was to get those people, uh, to end those atrocities. He, he got the prisoners released. Uh, and also eventually uh, Croatia removed uh, Mate Boban and replaced him uh, with a much more uh, agreeable uh, and uh, forward-looking leadership. Uh, and that in turn paved the way to the Washington Agreement, which took, uh, which not only ended the fighting between the Muslims, uh, Cro um, the Muslims and the Croats in Bosnia, and again, uh, uh, I was there, but Mate Granic was a key architect of that, 
uh, but it set the stage for a military uh, alliance uh, between the two sides that in the course of some 15 months changed the military situation on the ground uh, in Bosnia and Croatia. Uh, the, um, and, and that also was accompanied by uh, a decision that President Clinton made and that I implemented uh, uh, to permit the flow of weapons across Croatia to Bosnia. Now, mind you, in, 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 uh, in violation of a UN arms embargo. Now, mind you, the United States did not violate the arms embargo. We did not send weapons. Uh, and we were under no obligation to enforce the arms embargo. Croatia and Serbia were already violating the arms embargo, which was an unjust uh, uh, embargo in any event. And so Croatia's decision, which they did with our permission, uh, to permit arms to flow across uh, 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 Croatia to Bosnia helped shift the military balance in Bosnia. Now, a lot of focus was on the fact that some of these weapons came from Iran, but the reality is that most of them came from places other than Iran. Um, uh, then, uh, as uh, uh, Luka Misicic said, there was the uh, uh, Operation Storm and how that set the stage uh, for Dayton. Uh, the NATO bombing was a supplementary uh, fact, but it's also important to understand why, and, and what's important to understand is the role of the United States here too. Uh, now, uh, Mate Granic, I, I think will agree with me. Uh, the Croatia came and asked the United States, asked me, but of course I got instructions, what our attitude would be if they took military action. Uh, and this question actually had arisen previously in November of 1994, when there was another effort by both the Krajina Serbs and uh, uh, the Bosnian Serb army to take Bihać. And at that time, I had uh, been instructed to tell President Tudjman, no, don't do it. We don't want a wider war. But after Srebrenica, uh, the US took a different position. I, I can't say that it was uh, automatic. It required a lot of lobbying to get the right instructions. And our position was, we are not going to object. Uh, and again, it was that military action that uh, changed the situation on the ground it was much easier to get to a 51-49 split when the Bosnian Serbs held 45% of, um, of, of, of Bosnian territory than when they held 70%. Uh, and, and so th this was uh, uh, absolutely a, a key development. Uh, also part of it was uh, it took some time to get Washington to recognize it that we couldn't get a settlement in Bosnia without having a settlement in Croatia, uh, and hence the, the parallel tracks that went to, to solve the problems in uh, uh, Eastern, Eastern Slavonia, culminating in the Erdut Agreement just nine days before the Dayton Peace Agreement. Um, there were a lot of, a lot of points when the, the history could have turned out very differently. Um, uh, we, I was with Holbrook and he and I debated uh, or discussed, we didn't really debate, uh, should we, uh, we, we certainly privately, he and I would meet with Tujman alone and then the larger team would meet. And in our private meetings, we, um, we did uh, encourage him, Croatia, to take some of these towns in Bosnia. I think we always regretted, I certainly did, that uh, although we had urged Croatia to take Priodor and Kozorats that they didn't. And we were very ambivalent about Banja Luka, uh, but we were concerned about the, not, not so much of, uh, uh, of wanting the Bosnian Serbs to hold Banja Luka, but the humanitarian consequences of a military offensive there where you would then have hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to squeeze through the Posavina corridor. But the history is as it is. Uh, we did get to Dayton and uh, as, as uh, Ali Izabegovic said when he signed the agreement, he said, this is not a just agreement, but it would be even more unjust to continue the war. And I, I think the future of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is obviously going to be with Europe, uh, as with the Irish uh, conflict, which lasted uh, generations. 
uh, it was much eased by the process of, of European integration. And, and I think the same thing will be true for Bosnia and Herzegovina over time. When people aren't killing each other, when there's life, there's always hope.